Welcome back to the Agentic Schools Manifesto. This is Chapter 2, The Benefits of the Catalytic Pedagogy Paradigm. Does engaging students cause you and your team to expend vast amounts of energy in order to overcome their resistance to instruction? Some resistance to instruction is to be expected, but the default paradigm causes student engagement with instruction to be far slower, less efficient, and more wasteful than necessary. Allow me to paint a picture of the improvements that we can expect from the catalytic pedagogy paradigm. When a pedagogy becomes catalytic, certain conditions around the instructional process have been created that make it more efficient and effective. Catalysis is a term from chemistry that refers to the use of a substance that makes a chemical reaction between other chemicals faster, more energy efficient, and less wasteful. The graph on page 6 of the book shows the effects of a catalyst. Remember that the book is available as a membership benefit for joining Deeper Learning Advocates at dladvocates.org. The graph has progress of reaction on the horizontal axis and energy on the vertical axis. There is a straight horizontal line starting on the left side about halfway up labeled A. About a third of the way across, it splits into two lines, a gray one labeled B and a black one labeled C. Both lines rise from the bifurcation point. The gray line B rises nearly to the top of the graph before dropping again, while the black line B rises only about a third as high before also dropping. They meet up again about a quarter of the way up from the bottom of the graph, where they rejoin to become a fourth line labeled D. There are dashed lines running horizontally from the point of the bifurcation of line A into lines B and C, and from each of the peaks of the two lines. The span from the bifurcation point to the peak of line C is labeled E, while the span from the bifurcation point to the peak of line D is labeled F. The labels E and F each have a small lightning bolt next to them, and there is a legend that shows that the lightning bolt indicates activation energy. For a reaction to take place, an energy hill needs to be overcome. The height of the hill is known as the activation energy. The higher the hill, the more energy is needed. There are two pathways for the chemical reaction. There is a default level of reaction that occurs in the background simply because as long as the temperature is substantially above absolute zero, there is enough energy in the system to sometimes produce random molecular collisions that happen to surmount the activation energy hill. The pathway, shown as a gray line labeled B, that approaches the top of the graph is the energy profile for the reaction without the catalyst. And the pathway, shown as a black line labeled C, that does not go nearly as high, is the energy profile for the reaction with the catalyst. You can see that with the catalyst, the activation energy is lower. As a result of the activation energy being lower, there are more molecules with the required activation energy, and so more fruitful collisions occur per second, and hence the reaction is faster. The catalyzed reaction occurs on an alternative, quicker path. Less energy is required, and waste is minimized, because the catalyst returns to its original form, ready to do it all again. Let's apply the graph to schooling. Instead of showing chemical properties, we are looking at how students go from their default shallow learning labeled A into deeper learning labeled D. This process happens at some slow rate, independent of what we do, because human beings are inherently curious about their world and how it works. The reaction we are considering is the students' reactions to instruction. Their inherent curiosity creates a low-level background rate, but it is usually slow, inefficient, and wasteful. So, applying this idea to pedagogy, we can look at those three key aspects of children's reactions to instruction activation energy, efficiency, and waste products in the same graph on page 6. The pathway depicted as a gray line labeled B is showing us the activation energy labeled E, which is the amount required under the default paradigm. The pathway depicted as a black line labeled C shows us the activation energy labeled F, which is required with catalytic pedagogy, which is going to result in different rates of energy consumption, efficiency, and waste. Let's start and end with waste. The most important waste to consider in education comes from the epidemic of disengagement 
that has been well documented in both schools and the workplace, even though it gets very little attention in the media. For instance, according to Gallup, 70% of teachers report being disengaged. Based on a combination of expert estimations and direct surveys, we can be confident that students are also disengaged at a rate anywhere from 50 to 70 percent. It is not a stretch to assume that the habits learned in school have an effect on later workplace patterns. If the pattern carries over, then it makes sense of the fact that Gallup reports that the average rate of disengagement in the workplace globally is 85 percent. Gallup estimates that the 85 percent rate of workplace disengagement is costing about seven trillion dollars per year. That is a significant magnitude of waste. Plus, a 2015 report from the Carnegie Foundation called Motivation Matters pointed out that in schools in the USA, there is an engagement gap just like there is an achievement gap between minority and majority students. They also noted that the engagement gap is the more solvable problem of the two. Next, we want to consider activation energy which I take to be the role of motivation. In reviewing prior studies for my thesis, I discovered that about 30 years of research in mainstream schools found that the intrinsic motivation and engagement of students declined within each year and over the course of the years through high school graduation. The preferable term for the entire group of the less desirable, more external motivations is controlled. So I take it that mainstream schooling produces a lot of controlled motivations. My published thesis research was focused on the patterns of intrinsic motivation for students in two schools where instruction is an opt-in for students. The only courses they took were ones that they chose to take. It should come as no surprise that when children actively choose to take a class, they have a better chance of engaging more productively with it. What I found was that these schools maintain the intrinsic motivation of their students across the years, which is consistent with a few other studies of engagement in similarly alternative schools. While my thesis was focused on intrinsic motivation, the entire group of more desirable internal motivations is called autonomous. These schools support autonomous motivations in their students by being organized to give children the opportunity to opt into classes. This means the instructors expend much less energy getting students activated for making productive use of the instruction they receive. The instructional collisions that occur are more productive. Putting it this way makes an important distinction between productive and unproductive instructional interactions. Just because a student has an instructional interaction with an instructor in a classroom does not mean that it was an educationally productive incident. When the teacher gives students a passing grade just for having an interaction, that prevents us from telling the difference between productive and unproductive interactions. When grades and test scores reflect educationally unproductive interactions, I call that faux achievement or fake achievement. I've never met anyone who was successful as a student in mainstream classrooms in terms of test scores and or grades, who did not agree that at least part of the time their success depended on jumping through the hoops or just going through the motions without deeply learning the lessons taught. This is the main reason that the age segregation of children is a dubious practice educationally. There's no reason to believe that a student's age compared to their motivation is more than trivially important to effective instruction. Now we consider efficiency. In this case, you need to know that the state of Massachusetts compels children in the first through sixth grades to attend 180 days of school each year. Let's estimate that they will receive about an hour of math instruction per day for those six years, which means that those state public schools expect to take somewhere near a thousand hours to deliver that math curriculum. Now consider how efficiently the late Daniel Greenberg who was one of the co-founders of the Sudbury Valley School in Framingham, Massachusetts, taught the first through sixth grade math curriculum over many decades. You need to understand that all instruction at Sudbury Valley School is completely optional for all students ranging in age from 4 to 18 years old. 
In this case, he taught the entire first through sixth grade math curriculum with one hour a week of direct instruction with lots of homework over the course of just 20 weeks. He accomplished in 20 hours what the state of Massachusetts expected to take around a thousand. That is a much more efficient use of the instructional expertise that a teacher has to offer. But let's assume that Daniel Greenberg was an exceptional instructor and that when we take catalytic pedagogy to scale, we will get 10 times less of an efficiency gain than he claimed. So let's estimate basic math will take 200 hours. That's still 80% less than 1,000, so I'd say it's a worthwhile gain. The problem we have right now in the education system is that the mainstream of schooling is too slow to produce the deeper learning that we as a society need to meet the demands of our complex technological age. Without catalytic pedagogy, the amount of energy that we expend to maintain the current rate of student reactions to instruction is too high, the process is too slow, and there are too many waste products. When we add catalytic pedagogy, the activation energy will be lower, the process will be much faster, and there will be less waste. I don't really know how much of the $7 trillion that Gallup estimates we are losing to workforce disengagement will be eliminated. Even assuming other factors will still cause several trillion in waste, the gains will be worthwhile. Perhaps more important is that even without monetary gains, it will all be worthwhile due to the improvements in equity. I will talk about equity more later. So, to clarify, the whole phrase catalytic pedagogy refers to the context surrounding instruction that schools use to produce more autonomous motivations and to more fully engage their students and teachers in instruction. Requiring students to opt into classes is one way that can happen, but it is probably not the only way. It would be disappointing if my proposals cannot accommodate the tens of millions of children that are currently being harmed by the mainstream model of schooling. Next, we turn our attention to ensuring that the changes we make will be effective at a large scale. That means we need to explore both the moral and scientific foundations of catalytic pedagogy. This concludes the second episode of the Agentic Schools Manifesto series, if you would like to gain access to the illustrations, the footnotes, the appendices, and the bibliography, the PDF and illustrated video versions of the book are available as membership benefits when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. If you would like more information about the catalytic pedagogy philosophy, how self-determination theory applies in education, and what it will take to transform education systems around the globe, check out my other website, holisticequity.org. There, under the Tools tab, you will find a variety of valuable ways to either deepen your understanding or apply that understanding in your school. Thank you for your kind attention.